Hello, everyone. I'm Sharon Hawks, the director of Nahant Public Library. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a project that we had done uh, during the fiscal 2021 to 22 year called Artifacts in Your Library. To do that, I'm going to share some slides with you. And here we are. Before I begin, we would like to begin today's talk by acknowledging the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous people from whom the colony, province, and Commonwealth of Massachusetts have taken their name and who encamped in the haunt before the arrival of European explorers and colonists. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historical Massachusetts tribe territories to this day. Artifacts in Your Library was a year long project. The, the course of it was to uh, better identify, preserve and interpret the library's art and artifacts collections. With a federal grant by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, we completed a number of activities. We digitally photographed the historic artwork with the help of Robert Wilson, and I wanna thank him here. Uh, for example, the uh, painting you're looking at now is the Mifflin House at 40 Steps, was digitized among many others. They were all uploaded to Digital Commonwealth, digitalcommonwealth.org with the help of Boston Public Library. And I want to acknowledge Nicole Shea for her help. We created a self-guided tour brochure, which you can, and you can pick up a copy of that right in the library and you can see it on our website. And that was with the help of Miley Tria, so we thank her. We conducted a town-wide read. We read An Object of Beauty and we read Braiding Sweetgrass and held lectures on natives of New England, art history, and Native Americans today. We had signage in the library developed to better uh, understand the artwork and interpret it. Thank you to Bonnie D'Orlando, Julie Tarmi, and the Nahant Historical Society for their help. We created an art history kit for children ages eight and up. And we created side projects as they came up over the course of this project. Uh, it included the restoration of the John Eric Christian Peterson painting, Egg Rock with Lighthouse, and the creation of a, this land acknowledgement that you heard today, and an introduction to the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. This is the artwork that kind of started the uh, inspiration for the entire project. This is John Amory Codman. He lived from 1824 to 1886. And look at the detail of the strokes and the brush, the colors and the brush strokes in this painting. What happened was we had a family come visit us here at the library, and they were descendants of John Amory Codman. Codman, and they were asking to see uh, his painting. Well, we had a spreadsheet to all the artwork, and so I looked it up, took them to show them the painting. Then after they left, I realized that there was a second painting. This is uh, Ruins of the Nahant Hotel at East Point, and it's also painted by John Amory Codman. Also interesting in this painting, uh, which was done in 1861, you can see in, in the distance there uh, what looks like ruins. And those are actually the ruins of the beautiful hotel that was on East Point. So it's a very uh, distinct period of time in Nahant's history. So it's wonderful to have this painting in the collection. 
The library's artwork tells the story of its residents over time, beginning with its indigenous residents, the Massachusetts. Dan DiStefano's excellent scholarship here helps interpret the artifacts found here. And you can see this exhibit in the hall, in the East Hall when you walk in. And the tribe used primarily uh, Nahant as a fishing point. They were not a nomadic tribe, but they circulated among several different campgrounds. Nahant was used for fishing, so many of the artifacts reflect that. Uh, the artifacts and the art were from Herbert Foster Otis's Natural History Museum, which was quite an accumulation of things and were given to the library in 1925 by Otis's widow. Now, I will say that I have mixed feelings about the native portraits. Um, by the mid 1800s, as Native Americans continued to be uh, forced westward, there was sort of a feeling about the vanishing Indian. There was almost a nostalgia. Um, and yet the Native Americans were not vanishing at all. Um, but people were curious to learn about them and there were adventurers and portraitists and authors and book publishers happy to oblige with mixed amounts of accuracy or exploitation. The portraits here were made by Charles Bird King, who was commissioned by the federal government to paint the native get delegates who came in full regalia to negotiate their treaties. George Catlin is also uh, hanging on our walls. He journeyed into the wilderness to sketch tribal events and individuals fully executing his paintings much later than when he saw them and promoting them in exhibitions in the US and Europe. Those two artists and Rindlisbacher along uh, with others were incorporated into the two volume history of the Indian tribes of North America by Thomas L. McKenney and James Hall in 1836. And we have copies, uh, newer editions of those books as well. So here's the Nahant Hotel, or at least a, a drawing, a rendition of the Nahant Hotel in, in its glory days. Now, if you look around on this painting, uh, this drawing, you can see uh, many interesting details about how people spent their days at the watering place called Nahant. You can see um, a child here playing hoop, where you'd roll the hoop and try and catch it. Uh, you can see someone ready to go hunting. And way back here in the distance, you can see a giant swing set and people lined up ready to have a turn. So our art gives insight into how people spent their days in Nahant. So it's a very interesting uh, slice of history. The Falk Photo Company here in, uh, uh, they're a Boston company. They specialized in panorama photography and a few of which can be found in Digital Commonwealth. The one we have uh, shows both the age of the automobile and the fact that there were horse-drawn carriages, you can see on the left, um, still being used for travel. So it helps us date the photo to the early 1900s. This, by the way, would have been uh, right opposite where the Johnson School is today. Other projects came up in the course of the artifacts in your library project. We had an offer by Robert Burrill and Jeffrey Zimmer to look at the clock and see if they could get it running again, which they actually did. And so from time to time, we wind up the clock and show you that it still works. We're still in the process of, uh, at some point, the chimes need to be better restored. The clock itself is running. Thank you very much. 
the restoration of this Christensen painting was a serendipitous event associated with the project. Special thanks to Chris Mathias and Ken Torino and the Friends of Nahan Public Library for funding the restoration of this painting. You can see it's important because it's uh, painted at a time when the lighthouse was still on Egg Rock. But you can also see a lot of deterioration here. There were chips missing out of the painting. And there were gouges out of parts of the beautiful frame. So here's the painting fully restored. You cannot see where the painting paint was missing. They removed the yellowed varnish and restored the frame as well. Beautiful job. This map by Alonzo Lewis in 1842, it's a very important part of the project. Uh, so you can see a lot of detail here. This is jointly owned, by the way, by the library and the historical society. And there are lots and lots of details over here toward the left. You can see Bear Pond was much bigger. It's the pond that's on the golf course. And all of this blue indicates that it was uh, lowlands then as it is today and more of a wetland at that time with a river that went under a bridge and out into the bay. You can also see that um, the plots were divided up. It uh, indicates on the map exactly who originally received the plots of land from the city of Lynn. And uh, in some cases, who was the later owner is written in on the plots as well. Take a look up here though, around where Nahant Road is, you can see little dots and they're dots of green all along the road. And you can see them on some of the side roads as well. Those were trees that were planted here. The idea was in colonial times, Lynn sent people to take down all the trees on the island and, and to make grazing land for cattle and, and uh, some cropland. And so that's how it stayed for many, many years until the uh, end of the 1700s, early 1800s, when the uh, Johnson's Hoods and Breeds uh, built homes here and were finally allowed to do so. And Almost immediately, people came to Nahant by ship from uh, Boston in order to escape the crowding, the pollution, and enjoy nature and catch the salt air. And they felt that was a healthy thing to do and hike around and see the beautiful natural sights. And then there was a little complaining because uh, the sun was beating down and the wind was blowing through and it wasn't pleasant without trees. And so a gentleman named William Wood actually uh, took some time to uh, gather some books, gave them to start a library, and he asked that the money gathered, um, the library was not free, we're supposed to pay a small amount, and with that money, they should create a fund in order to plant trees and make pleasant shade. And so that's exactly what happened here. Uh, eventually, uh, Frederick Tudor, the Ice King, who owned all this Beltland here, um, took over the project and uh, really got going with um, planting trees. Most of the ones along Main Street, were pro uh, Nahant Road, were probably elms, which since have succumbed to Dutch elm disease. But I imagine that many of the trees that were planted then are still in extent. And so now uh, Nahant is looking at its tree project with a view toward uh, carefully replacing trees over time as they age out. Now, this map being digitized, uh, I should say in the library, it's, it's up high in a place that's not getting too much light so that the map doesn't deteriorate further or fade due to light. 
Um, but now having digitized it, we can zoom in on these various places and read them in great detail. So I was able to take this map down to Johnson Elementary School, teach the children how to find some of these uh, primary resources, such as this map in Digital Commonwealth, and then to zoom in. And I asked them if they could find where their house was located on this map and see who owned the land many, many years ago. Well, the art co collection continues to grow. Recent acquisitions uh, include this watercolor of a pinky schooner on the left by Dan Parapolitza and was donated by Esther Johnson. There are also two original uh, Norman La Liberté paintings. And these were donated by Anne Bromer. So what's next? Uh, I think what's next will be to restore more art, reframe some works, digitize the dedications in the 1819 book collection. That will be our next digital project, which is uh, happening right now as we speak in March of 2023. So I want to say thank you to everybody that helped us on this project and thank you for listening. <laughs>